All right. Um, sorry about that. Uh, just making sure everything is working now. I actually was coming down to my desk a couple minutes ago and um, I knocked over my router and my cable modem and everything kind of got screwed up and I'm hoping that uh, the cables are not damaged enough that the it can't output as many kilobits per second as it needs to to run the stream. Anyways, today we're going to mix together two of my favorite things, the Raspberry Pi and Kubernetes. I've been looking forward to this episode for the entire series so far, so I'm excited to finally be getting here. I even put on my special Raspberry Pi shirt in celebration today. As we do with all of our <coughs> live streams, please feel free to put where you're from in the in the live chat or in the comments if you're watching this after the fact. It's always Great to see people from all over the world participating. I actually looked at my analytics for this series, and only 22% of uh, the viewers are from the U.S., so I'm, I'm excited to see such a global interest in uh, this Kubernetes series. Anyways, today we're going to talk about bare metal Kubernetes, and uh, here's a picture of some servers. There are some people watching this, I'm sure, who have servers like these in their house, uh, I used to for a short time, and then I realized I didn't want to have 100 decibels of fans blowing into my face uh, while I was trying to do work. So I gave up on that, and I switched over to Raspberry Pis for a lot of things, or to uh, I have a an, an Dell PC and an HP and a Mac Mini sitting over there doing some things. Um, but anyway, what are some reasons why you'd want to use bare metal instead of Kubernetes in the cloud? And the main reasons would be if you want to have more control over performance, more control over the cluster settings itself, or uh, more security. For instance, if you had an air-gapped cluster, you obviously couldn't be running that inside of uh, someone's public cloud. So um, the, the performance especially is, is often a, a main reason for doing anything bare metal because you can, uh, there's, there's the famous case study of Stack Exchange their servers are all bare metal servers, and they can eke out a lot of performance with those servers because there's no hypervisors running. There's no uh, special cloud uh, storage stuff going in the background that, that causes th certain things to be a little slower. So that's one of the big reasons. The other big reason I see is for the control. You can configure the, the Kubernetes settings exactly how you want them. And if there's new features that are in alpha or something like that that are really convenient, for example, I remember the uh, job cleanup, jo uh, uh, the job cleanup automation that was in Kubernetes that was, has been in alpha for a long time, and you can't get it on Amazon or on Linode because it's in alpha still. Uh, so if you want to have control over those kind of things, you'd have to run uh, on your own servers, either bare metal or, or virtual machines or something like that. <laughs> but when you run with bare metal, um, there are some more difficulties. Uh, <laughs> You have physical infrastructure. You have to provide them with power. You have to provide them with uh, networking and routing of traffic. Uh, doing things like setting up a highly available control plane is actually pretty hard, and that's why if you're using uh, Google Cloud or Amazon, you, you might be paying a small premium for that. Uh, it, you might not be paying that premium in the cost of the control plane itself like you do with Amazon, uh, but you are paying a premium to have that in some place in your infrastructure. Uh, you also have to deal with storage backends. These pictures that I have on the screen right now, you can see there's tons of hard drives in those enclosures, but you might have to deal with iSCSI or SANS or um, other storage infrastructure that can be difficult to do right. And that's why cloud providers are popular because if you want an EBS volume, you're gonna get an EBS volume. You don't have to deal with all the storage solutions in the backend. Uh, also dealing with things like ELBs, uh, load balancing, uh, network ingress, how does traffic go into your cluster from external networks. Things like configuring routers, there's a reason why they have certifications and, and expensive networking gear. It's because it's kind of hard to do. And uh, some of my other videos that I've done on this channel have talked about uh, some of those networking difficulties. And that's on a very small scale. When you're talking about big clusters and things, that can be a, a big challenge. Uh, finally, you're going to have to deal with certificate management and things like that. If you, especially if you have a non-public cluster or something air-gapped, dealing with certificates is a lot harder than just throwing Cert Manager in because Cert Manager can't get certificates unless you do certain special things with it to get certificates from a place like Let's Encrypt. You have to deal with certificates in other ways. Um, 
So, and I, I noticed some people are talking about a few different things. We'll talk about some of the technologies that we can uh, rely on for these bare metal clusters soon. Uh, but I'm going to uh, start uh, my cluster with the Raspberry Pi <coughs> for a few different reasons. Uh, the main thing is it's the simplest, smallest, most inexpensive local bare metal cluster that I can think of. And I like all those things together. You can find maybe a cheaper way. You can find maybe a slightly more efficient way. Uh, you might even be able to build a smaller cluster. I, I know I actually built a cluster of Raspberry Pi Zeros, but found that I couldn't actually install Kubernetes on it because they only have 120 megs of RAM, or maybe 256, whatever it was, it was too small. Um, uh, but there are some nice things about the Pi cluster. First of all, the Raspberry Pi <clears throat> is very compact. It's a single board computer. It's like this big, fits in your hand, size of a credit card, basically. Even a small compact uh, Nook, uh, next unit of computing type computer, or a little uh, corporate blade, blade desktop or whatever, they're, they're still a lot bigger than the Raspberry Pi. And almost always the power supplies for these are external. So you have a bunch of external power supply cabling, uh, four plugs that you have to plug in for these things, and you still have a network switch. With the Raspberry Pi, I can put on a power over Ethernet hat and use a power over Ethernet switch, and I literally have four cables for my Pis, and that's it. Everything fits nicely on my desk. Um, it's, it's really, really easy. And the other thing that I've noticed with all my projects, I don't have a shot that I can show you right now of my desk, but it's uh, very cluttered. Um, <clears throat> if I have a, a project that requires me to spend 30 minutes setting it up and 30 minutes tearing it down, and it takes up half of my desk, I'm not going to do that much. But if I have a Raspberry Pi cluster that I can just pick up and set down wherever I want, there's a good chance that I'm actually going to set it up, turn it on, and learn something with it. Uh, so that's a, that's a big thing for me. Uh, the other thing that's nice about this is, well, th this one has the PoE fans. These little fans, they can get a little bit loud and annoying sometimes. Um, but you can build this without those fans and just have one little fan on the back or use heat sinks and everything stays cool and it's not super loud. Uh, as somebody who has run actual servers and storage units and things with those server fans, they get super duper loud. Like I sometimes complain about my laptop, which right now is the fan is running full tilt, uh, but it is like 20 times quieter than those server fans. <coughs> so the next thing is um, energy efficiency is also something that, that I care about with these clusters. You know, sure, the environment and things like that, but, but the main thing is um, if you're, you know, if I'm going to plug this in on my desk, which I already have two monitors, my speakers, my light, my camera, all these, all these different things plugged into, I don't want to plug in an extra 800 watts of computers, especially the older computers had use more power typically. Um, and, and if you do that, then you're going to be using a lot more energy. You might need to have a dedicated circuit for those servers, something like that. The Raspberry Pi, this whole cluster uses about 10 to 15 watts uh, at idle and maybe, maybe 20 watts at full tilt using full power. <coughs> so it's really nice to, to do that. And some people are like, oh, just use some old laptops. It's easy to acquire laptops and things. But um, the energy efficiency of a laptop a lot of times comes from sleep, hibernation, and low power modes, which it won't reach when you're using a Kubernetes cluster because Kubernetes is always doing things in the background that kind of negates some of that energy savings that you get. Um, now, there is a major caveat. Uh, <laughs> the performance per watt will be higher on most Intel or AMD chips. Obviously, if you're talking about Apple's M1, which is not available in any form factor other than a Mac right now, th that equation is a little different for an ARM processor. But the ARM processors in these Raspberry Pis uh, have lower performance per watt, raw performance, if you're going full tilt than, let's say, an i3, i5, i7, i9 processor or something like that, or an Epic. You know, these are not going to beat a Threadripper. They do have four cores, and they do have decent performance for a five- or six-year-old chip now. Uh, but they're not going to be the best performance per watt. So if you're doing high performance computing, if you're doing billions of transactions or something, this is not going to be the solution for that. Um, <clears throat> another thing I wonder is on your current workstation, 
like I have my laptop here, how many gigabytes of RAM do you have on it and what kind of storage do you have on it? You probably have fast NVMe storage. I have the MacBook Pro Core i9. It has a hard drive that can pump through like two gigabytes per second, which is insane and crazy. Uh, it has 32 gigabytes of RAM. The Raspberry Pi, <coughs> um, oh, I have an extra slide here. The Raspberry Pi cluster, uh, it has limitations. And uh, I, I like to come back to this sometimes and think about the fact that when you deal with limitations, when you start from square one, this is wax on, wax off from uh, a, a a movie that came out just before I was born. Um, when you deal with these limitations, when you learn from a foundation of one simple thing and you learn it really well, and then you apply that to something greater, you're going to have a much better knowledge of something like Kubernetes, which is really complicated. And uh, in the movie, it, uh, the uh, Mr. Miyagi tells him to wax on and wax off, and he does two simple motions but he does them over and over again to the point where he builds up the muscle memory and the muscle mass to be able to do those motions, which are essential to his fighting style in karate so that he can be a very powerful karate master at some point. Um, but uh, in Kubernetes, the same kind of thing can be learned from the Pi. One of the first things that I learned with uh, running things on the Raspberry Pi is you always wanna make sure you add resource limits so that your applications can't accidentally take over a whole node and cause that node to start having problems. This happens in the cloud too, when you have 32, 64, 128 gigs of RAM, it can still happen if your application just goes wild. So learning those, those things on the Raspberry Pi, which has much less RAM and much less disk speed and slower networking and things like that, allowed me to apply those learnings to larger clusters and get more speed out of them. Also. It taught me to always make sure I'm monitoring my CPU and memory usage to see if there's any weird fluctuations in certain nodes. Uh, you can also see some problems with the nodes themselves. Maybe some software in the background outside of Kubernetes is causing issues that causes issues then in your Kubernetes uh, in the containers that are running. Um, the other thing that this made me do, especially with something like Drupal, which is more complex, is work on finding ways to optimize the way I deploy them so that when things happen, when your networking goes bad, when your micro SD card starts getting a little weird and slow, uh, when the CPU gets, gets loaded up, when that happens, your application can do one of two things. It can just completely fail and be horrible and slow and dead, or it can deal with it and maybe show a spinning little spinner or do something like that. So the Raspberry Pi taught me how to uh, how to always approach things from the perspective of it's going to fail, so plan for that instead of I have a Porsche or a Lamborghini or something, and you know I can go as fast as I want, and then when things do fail, they do even in the most expensive perfect cloud infrastructure ever. When they do fail, you'll be more prepared for it. And the last thing I'll say about performance and scaling on the Pi is. If you can make your application run fast on a Raspberry Pi, I guarantee it's gonna run even faster and your users are gonna be a lot happier when you pop it onto a really beefy cluster. But things aren't always sunshine and rainbows on Raspberry Pis. The, the first thing is uh, the Raspberry Pi OS currently, the default one that you get if you go to the Raspberry Pi downloads page, and this is 2021, this could change sometime, I hope it will. The default OS is 32-bit ARM. And there are so few uh, there are so few images for 32-bit ARM platform in uh, in Docker Hub and Quay and wherever else that uh, you will run into what's on the screen right now quite a bit if you download 32-bit PyOS and install Kubernetes on it and start trying to run things on it because um, AMD and Intel processors still dominate the server industry and that seems to be changing but it's not a super fast change and it's not going to change like overnight. Um, so you'll see this a lot, and there could be two reasons. One is there's no ARM32 version and you're running PyOS ARM32, or even if you're on the 64-bit version of PyOS, you could still run into this if there's only an Intel or AMD version. I've, I've never encountered a, a situation where there's like only PowerPC or some other flavor, Spark, I don't know what else there is out there. Um, uh, but anyway, there are four things, though, that are making this a lot better. First of all, the Raspberry Pi OS 64-bit beta, beta has been super stable. It's been out since almost a year now. I, th I think it was April last year that came out. So I've been running that on all my servers. 
Um, there's also Ubuntu for Raspberry Pi, which is 64 bits, and it works great. Uh, it's a great option. Um, <clears throat> and then also a couple things that have made it more uh, prevalent to have actual ARM64 builds of images is Amazon now has Graviton processors, which are slightly cheaper for the same performance, and they're ARM-based. So if you're going to build for ARM, it'll run on those processors. It's 64-bit ARM. Also, Apple's M1 processor, which is now shipping in some Macs, which is super fast and super amazing and has all these great technologies and things. More developers are targeting that platform, which is also ARM64. Um, and tools like Docker's BuildX are making it easier to build multi-arch images. So you can have one image build, and just with a couple lines of change or just use, switching the tool that you use to build it, you can build it now for Intel, for uh, ARM64, for PowerPC, or whatever other platforms you want, even if you just have an Intel server. You can build on all those other platforms using some virtualization technology. Um, <clears throat> so, and even if you run into this error, there are ways to mitigate it. First of all, what I've done for uh, some of the things that I, like in, in the Drupal world, there aren't a ton of Drupal images out there. Uh, so I actually built one that runs on ARM32, ARM64, and Intel. Uh, but there, there's often, often an alternative image, like, you know, the, the prime example here is the MySQL image, which, you know, a lot of people have switched to MariaDB or Postgres or something else like that. But the official MySQL image still doesn't have an ARM version. So uh, there are plenty of alternatives out there, though, that do have ARM versions. So <clears throat> now that I've decided to build a cluster on a Raspberry Pi, the next thing we have to decide is what flavor of Kubernetes are we going to install? So <clears throat> in Linode and Amazon and all these other platforms, pretty much all of them use Kubernetes, K8S, Kates. Uh, that's what we've been using in this whole course so far. But there are other distributions or flavors of, of Kubernetes out there. And it seems like any company that's serious about trying to become the next cloud computing platform or something, all of them have their own flavor. And each flavor has its own little nuance. Uh, you have MicroKates, K3S, and KOS, or Chaos. Um, <clears throat> these are by Canonical Rancher and Mirantis. They focus on edge computing and on lower resource consumption. They take out a few of the features of Kubernetes that are less used and focus on making a smaller, more compact distribution that, that's easier to install and configure and things like that. And uh, earlier this year, I actually talked about the Turing Pi, which I have one here. Uh, this, this is the, the version 2 board. or so, Well, this is the, the first version, but it's a, the second production batch. Um, <clears throat> and this board doesn't have as much horsepower because it, it uses the Compute Module 3, which has a maximum of one gigabyte of RAM and has a much slower CPU. So I actually installed K3S on it because it uses fewer resources than, than Kubernetes Kates. And uh, it ran pretty well. It, it's, it's still a little bit slower because, like I said, there's this board, the uh, Compute Module 3 Plus is a, is a bit slower in general. Um, <clears throat> but But anyway, uh, each one of these focuses on a different thing. OpenShift is the, the one I have at the end there, and this is not a comprehensive list. There's a bunch of other distributions out there. Even if you have Docker Desktop running, which I do on my Mac, uh, it comes with its own built-in little Kubernetes cluster. Um, but OpenShift by Red Hat is actually <laughs> like the other, other end of the spectrum from all the edge-based ones. Uh, it requires at least 16 gigabytes, and it recommends 32 or I think maybe even 64 gigabytes of RAM for its uh, master controller servers, and uh, it, it requires a lot of servers. So that's pretty much out of the question when we're talking about Raspberry Pis. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but Kubernetes itself has always, not always, but I think since 2014, 2015, well, I don't remember exactly when... Uh, this happened. It might have been 2016 or 2017. I don't remember. Uh, somebody focused on making sure that it ran well on ARM. And I think it was somebody who actually was trying to keep it running on Raspberry Pis, which only had a gigabyte of RAM at the time. Kubernetes requirements have snuck up over the years a little bit, and I think it's a minimum of two gigabytes. Uh, but the Raspberry Pi 4 that I'm using in this cluster comes with two, four, or eight gigabytes of RAM, so it can run full Kubernetes. Now, it is a little bit slower to run full Kubernetes than K3S or KOS or MicroKates or something like that, um, <clears throat> but it runs pretty pretty darn well, I'd say. Um, but now that we've decided 
at least I've decided I want to run the full Kubernetes because I want to have a proxy of what I'm running in the full cloud when I'm on Linode or Amazon or something like that. I want to run the full Kubernetes, but how do I actually install it? Well, there's a lot of different options for that. Uh, there are some pre-built options for kind of configuring a cluster that you have. One of them is CubeSpray. This one's been around forever and ever. I think it's built on Ansible. Um, and uh, it, it basically, you, you give it an inventory of all your servers that you're going to run your cluster on. And then it, uh, <clears throat> then it will kind of, it sprays Kubernetes on it, I guess, and gets it all running. And I think it, it lets you set up a high availability cluster. Um, <clears throat> it has all these features up here. I don't have to spout all this off. Uh, but that's one way to do it. Uh, and this is, a lot of people do use this for production clusters. And you can also deploy into a public cloud. So you could have a bare metal cluster and a public cloud-based cluster both running with the same configuration, which is nice. Uh, another option is COPS or KOPS. Um, and it, it's a similar approach, but it uses different software uh, to do it. Uh, it will configure a cluster for you. Um, I think COPS is a little bit more, uh, more for like managing multiple clusters, whereas CubeSpray is focused on individual cluster management. Um, but there's also Cube Admin, Cube ADM, which is a tool that's built into the Kubernetes ecosystem. And uh, it, as it says here, it's a tool to provide best practice fast paths for creating Kubernetes clusters. Um, it, basically, it's the simplest way to build a quick Kubernetes cluster outside of using a different distribution like K3S, which has a nicer installer uh, or something like that. But it, the way that it works is you basically run an init command on your master or controller server, and then you run a join command on all the nodes that you want to join to the cluster, and that's about it. It does everything else for you. You have to install a few prerequisites to get it onto that server, uh, and you have to also install your own uh, container uh, lifecycle management tool. Like uh, In my case, I use uh, Containerd, but you could use Cryo, which we've talked about a few episodes back. Um, and there's also other ways you, you could build a cluster the hard way. Uh, if you haven't seen this, um, I wouldn't recommend in a one-on-one -on -one level series just jumping in this way right away, especially if you're not super familiar with the actual cloud infrastructure that backs everything. Uh, but it is a good way to see how all the little basic parts of Kubernetes are working. This is a guide for bringing up a Kubernetes cluster from the primitives. So Cube Admin and CubeSpray and all these tools, they kind of mask a lot of things from you, like configuring certificates and the, the networking and all those underlying parts that make up a Kubernetes cluster. So this is something that's fun to do if you ever have a weekend or something and you want to you go through and see all the guts of Kubernetes. That's probably the best way to do it. Um, uh, but I'm going to go with Cube Admin uh, for this particular project and uh, I built a little bit of lightweight automation to do all this setup using Ansible. So in a sense, it's a little bit like CubeSpray, but I tried to make it basically as minimal as possible in terms of the setup and, and things like that so that it's more Cube, cube Admin doing the work. Um, so let me hide that and uh, we'll start getting our hands dirty with the Raspberry Pi Dramble. And the first thing I have is, uh, so I... I I have this cluster all put together right now, uh, but I actually put it together yesterday after it was in a box for a couple months. Um, the website, pydramble.com, I, I have it, it, it says it's running on a cluster right now, but it's actually running on a single Raspberry Pi over there right now. Thank you very much, Pastudan. Pas pa pas uh, thanks for loving the channel. Hopefully you're a subscriber too, that'd be awesome. Um, anyways, I have... I have this running on a single Pi right now just because I'm using the cluster for a lot of testing, and I have been for a couple months now. Uh, but I have an ASMR video of the assembly that I'd love to share with you now. <laughs> 
So as I mentioned, I have I have this website, the Raspberry Pi Dremel site, uh, www.pydremel.com. It's been around since 2014, actually. I started building this cluster back then. The first version, I think I had six Raspberry Pi 2 nodes, and I, I had uh, Ansible installing Nginx and PHP and Apache and uh, MySQL and NFS all on separate servers. But it evolved over the years, and in 2017, I finished converting it all to Kubernetes, and now everything is running inside Kubernetes. Uh, but this website documents the entire process, and on the wiki, it actually has, if you wanted to build the exact same cluster, I have all the parts linked here. Uh, I have even um, different ways of controlling LEDs for statuses and things. I have these cool things that are a little expensive. These are, I think they're NeoPixels on, what is this called? Uh, Blinkstick Nanos. Uh, this is a little USB chip, and I don't think it'll focus, but anyways, it's a little USB chip that has two uh, controllable NeoPixels on it, and it's easy to control in software. So I can do things like uh, have the Kubernetes node status on them, things like that. I actually have a video uh, where I use Ansible to play the theme song from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, so check that out on YouTube as well. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I also recorded a more in-depth video. So the ASMR video is kind of like a tongue-in-cheek. It's kind of ridiculous, the things that you see on YouTube if you accidentally get sucked into that vortex at some point. Um, but I do have a, a more in-depth build video where I'm going to talk about uh, how I put together the cluster, um, how I set it up with Ansible, and I used NFS for storage and Trafic for ingress. Uh, so here's that video, and I'm going to take a drink while I, uh, while I play that back for you. So we already saw how to put together this Dramble cluster in the ASMR fashion, uh, but here is a video clip that I recorded earlier this year when I was comparing putting this cluster together uh, to putting together the Turing Pi cluster and just showing how there's a lot more steps involved when you have to wire every single little thing together. You have to put all the cases together. You have to, as you see in here, put all these little nuts on all the little levels of it to put everything together. It's a lot more complicated to set, set up this cluster physically uh, than it is to set up the Turing Pi cluster, which is one reason I like that Turing Pi for experimentation. Um, but it is easier than putting together a bunch of laptops or a bunch of old computers. You can see everything fits in my hands here. It's, it's a nice little compact setup, um, and, and I, I like to, to work with it. So anyway, what I did for my cluster was I put Raspberry Pi OS Beta 64-bit version. You could also use Ubuntu 64-bit uh, for Pi, um, but, but I enjoy using the 64-bit version mostly because a lot more Docker containers nowadays are compatible with ARM64, and there's very few that are building for ARM32 bit. Uh, so you can you can get things to work on 32 bit, but the 64 bit Pi OS is going to run a lot nicer. The first thing that you need to do once you get everything set up is to find the IP addresses of your cluster nodes. And I, you can either use Nmap or I'm using uh, an app called Fing here, uh, F I N G. And uh, it, basically, you have to find the IP address and the MAC address, and then I have a playbook that I run after I copy all my SSH keys to these four nodes, I have an Ansible playbook that automates the process of setting up the network. If you want to do it manually, you can, but basically you have to set uh, either custom IPs or just configure all the IPs of your, your Raspberry Pis or whatever other computers. And you also have to let them communicate with each other. So I set up a DHCP name like cube1, cube2, cube3, cube4, uh, and set that up inside each node, and then I rebooted them to make sure that they could run correctly. After that, I use this playbook. This is an Ansible playbook. It's uh, just a bunch of automation that runs and um, installs uh, Kubernetes. Um, it, uh, it sets up NFS on the master server. It builds in um, all the security settings for the servers themselves that's important to have. Um, it does all that stuff. And then at the end of that Ansible playbook, which automates everything, and as I've said many times before, this Kubernetes 101 series, in every description for um, these videos, there's a link to get Ansible for Kubernetes for $5. Um, take advantage of that offer because all the things that I do in this playbook are described in that Ansible for Kubernetes book, which I'm still working on and I'll have it finished. But the cool thing is if you buy that book, you'll get every update that I make to it forever for free through LeanPub, which is great. Um, but it uses Ansible to automate all this because when you're working with bare metal servers, it's hard to manage everything by hand. 
when you're dealing with four servers or even two or three servers, uh, all the setup that you have to do for bare metal, um, whether it's the security of the servers themselves, configuring auto updates, um, doing even things like booting them or rebooting them, uh, managing the software that's on the nodes, because Kubernetes has a stack that it needs to have running in the background, and you need to manage that. So I use Ansible for that. You can use other tools too. Uh, but anyway, uh, once that's done, though, you need to go in and uh, on, on your computer, or if you have your own DHCP server running locally, uh, you can set this up. But I, I set up on my computer uh, an alias in my hosts file to cluster.pydramble.test. And you can point this at any of the four nodes with my Dramble configuration. There are other ways to do this. You could, you could have a separate Raspberry Pi running Metal LB uh, or running Nginx or something and have it as the front for your entire cluster. Uh, I'm not going to cover that in depth in this video. That's a little bit more of an advanced topic, I think. Um, but that is an option that you can use instead of pointing your ingress <laughs> all at, at one of the four servers, because if that server goes down, then your ingress goes down. After that's all done, uh, I could access the cluster at cluster.pydremel.test. This is the Drupal site that we saw a few episodes ago, how to set it up. And all the configuration is already in the cluster, all the secrets all the MySQL config, all that stuff. So it installs Drupal. And then I'm, I set up the site just as I did before, uh, putting in all the relevant details and installing everything that I needed for Drupal. And uh, it's it's a pretty simple process. Um, and I use the password admin. But luckily, in this case, you cannot access this cluster because this cluster is on my private network. If you have access to my private network, first of all, please get off of it. And second of all, um, that would be a very big security breach. Uh, but one big difference you see here with, with the cluster running in the Dramble, these Raspberry Pis, is uh, that the first few page loads, there's a lot of resources that aren't loading in right, like CSS files and maybe some JavaScript. And that's because the NFS on the Raspberry Pis is actually a lot slower than the NFS that we were using when we were on Linode. So it's something to keep in mind uh, talking about those limitations that we had with uh, slower Raspberry Pis, you see some of the, the things that are slower when you have slower storage with micro SD cards on the Raspberry Pi. And it can show you flaws in your application where something can load in and it's not actually fully loaded because something on the back end still hasn't written that file out to the network and read it in on all the other nodes or something like that. So it's an area where it can be annoying sometimes because things are slower, but it can also help you find ways to make your applications run better with those limitations in place. Anyways, I'm going to pass it back to myself yet again. So here you go, Jeff. All right. <clears throat> so, um, and and that this this Raspberry Pi Dramble cluster has always been. Uh, it uses the I forget what they call this, like a dog bone board or something. It's it's just an acrylic, a piece of cut acrylic with these little risers uh, between them, and the Raspberry Pis are screwed into the, each board. And uh, it's used as form factor since the first version that I built. A lot of people build their own custom cases either out of acrylic or 3D printed cases. Um, the nice thing about this is anything that's in a Raspberry Pi 4 uh, form factor with the same screw locations can be mounted as an additional node by just adding space to the top. And I actually have. Uh, this is the Source Kit Pi Tray Mini right here. Uh, let's see if this focuses. There you go. Um, this is actually a Compute Module 4 carrier board that's in the same footprint as the Raspberry Pi 4. You can see there's the gigabit network, HDMI, and USB. And on the other side, there's a USB C plug. Um, this is a nice board for flashing uh, EMMC versions of the Compute Module 4, but it can also be used to stick a Pi 4 into a cluster like this because uh, it's the same hole locations. Now, I'd love to see a future version of this also have a little mini PCIe slot or NVMe or something on the backside uh, so that I can have faster storage for NAS or something like that. Uh, this could be a great NFS server for the cluster. Uh, this version doesn't have that stuff, and it doesn't expose the PCIe lanes at all. But if it did, uh, that would be a really cool way to do that, and I would definitely be adding in uh, Compute Module 4s to my current cluster for that better speed. Um, but there's also other form factors that are making it even better. I, I mentioned this a couple times, but the Turing Pi, uh, even though it was slower, it, in some ways it was more fun to work with because you just have this one board, and I actually have a tiny mini ITX, ITX case that this mounts in, and it, it makes things like the power and, and networking requirements even easier because there's one, there's one Ethernet jack for the entire cluster. Uh, 
There's a lot of limitations with this current version, though, with the, with the Compute Module 3. It's 100 megabit networking, so way slower than I'm used to on the Pi 4 with its gigabit networking. Um, it has USB 2.0. It doesn't have any PCIe uh, lanes exposed. Uh, the RAM is a maximum of one gigabyte per node, which is not much. Uh, a lot of things barely even run in that, or some things don't run at all. Uh, but Turing Pi is going to be releasing a Turing Pi version 2. Uh, let me pop over here. So if I go to TuringPi.com, uh, the Turing Pi 2 is going to use the Compute Module 4, which takes all of those downsides and, and flips them and gives you gigabit. Uh, it'll give you uh, SATA ports for hard drives that are faster. Um, it'll give you mini PCIe. A lot, of, a lot of neat new features that'll make uh, for a much, much faster, um, much, much faster system overall. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, and, you know, if, if you Google Raspberry Pi cluster, you'll see a lot of inspiration for different things that you can do. If you're a lot better than me at 3D printing, so far I've printed a lot of things where the first layer prints and the second layer starts pulling the first layer off the board. I'm still working on uh, getting my Ender printer set up. Um, if you're better than me, you can probably do some pretty creative things with 3D cases and a, a big fan that's at a low speed or something like that to make a s almost silent cluster with however many Raspberry Pis you want. Um, there's even rack mount solutions with Raspberry Pi blades and things. Check out Uptime Labs on Instagram for some inspiration there. Um, but um, what are some next steps after all this? What are some of the things that we want to do uh, with our bare metal cluster uh, I noticed a few, somebody mentioned in the, in the chat that, uh, oh, yet another person who mentioned Metal LB but didn't actually talk about setting it up. The reason for that is setting up Metal LB is, is not, uh, it's not like, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I could do it in less than 20 to 45 minutes from scratch in a way that I'm actually teaching you how to use it. So I might do a separate video on this at some point. Uh, but Metal LB lets you set up uh, the load balancing just like you'd have in a cloud environment. And, uh, but you have to make some changes to your network or to your, if you have a DHCP server running or something like that, you, you have to integrate it with that. And uh, so it, it's not something I could, I could just show in a few minutes here. And that's the reason I didn't want to get into it. Uh, but I do want to get into it at some point on this channel. Uh, the other thing that I didn't talk about today, but I have talked about in the past, um, let me get, uh, my window management is terrible. Uh, I also talked about monitoring, uh, this is not the right one here. I have the wrong link on here, but anyway, uh, episode four of my Raspberry Pi cluster series from earlier this year, I talked about adding in Grafana and Prometheus, and there's actually a, f a fork of the official kind of like bundled solution. Uh, that I, I forget who it is, Carlos DP or somebody has it on their GitHub. And if you install it on your cluster, it'll even do things like uh, temperature monitoring for the Raspberry Pis to make sure they're not overheating and things like that, um, which is really useful if you want to build a silent cluster with heat sinks. You want to make sure that they're also not overheating from having too much of a workload. Uh, so you'll want to, to do that. Um, you can check out my entire Raspberry Pi cluster series. This is the Turing Pi review in this episode. Um, uh, but that whole series has a lot more information. I go way deeper into a lot of different areas for Raspberry Pi specific Kubernetes cluster uh, setup. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to it, it. Besides the Turing Pi version 2, there's there's also some other projects that are coming and, uh, and I think will be really cool. Uh, and a couple of them I'm not allowed to talk about yet, uh, but, but there are... There was a, an industrial solution. I think it's like a DIN rail mounted Raspberry Pi cluster uh, that's built with the Compute Module 4 in mind and um, had, had some neat features. I'm still trying to figure out uh, if, if there's any way I can acquire one of those and, and take it for a spin because that looks like a cool idea. And I had this crazy plan of maybe like mounting like three of those clusters on my wall or something like that. Anyways. Um, before I, I wrap things up, I, uh, I wanted to answer a few of the questions from the live chat. Uh, and if you have questions and it's afterwards and you know, you're not in the live stream right now, please feel free to post them in the comments. I, I try to get to as many of those as I can. Uh, and other people can also get back to you as well. Uh, the first thing is a few people were asking about information about the playbooks that I use or things like that. 
everything is listed on pydramble.com. So there's a wiki with benchmarks and all the setup instructions and getting all the hardware and parts together. Um, I try to keep this page updated with some appearances and, and places where I've shown this cluster and, and explored more about it. I should probably add links to this video here at some point. Uh, but this website itself is also open source and uh, it's it's a Drupal website that, that is managed on GitHub as well. Uh, but all the playbooks are in this GitHub repository, the Raspberry Pi Dramble repository. It's also linked in the description of this video if you want to get there that way. Um, and uh, like I said, it's been around since 2014 and has gone through three or so major evolutions from the first six node version to a five node version and now this four node version. And you might be wondering, like, why do you keep making it smaller? Why doesn't the cluster get bigger? Because bigger is always better. Well, one of the main things that I want is compactness, so a small size and uh, cost efficiency. So you don't want to be, you, you don't want to add on tons of cost for something that you're using for experimentation and learning, especially since I'm I'm reflashing these micro SD cards quite often. Um, the more nodes you have, the more the price goes up, the more everything goes up. And the main reason I settled on four instead of five or six now is this uh, Netgear GS305P. Uh, let me switch to the uh, Sony here so you can see it a little bit better. This uh, PoE switch actually costs like 50 bucks. The 8 port one costs like 110 bucks. You might get it on sale sometimes, but um, <laughs> this was cheaper. It fit into my little box better. And uh, that's the main reason it's four nodes because uh, there's four ports here. So uh, the other thing about this, this setup with PoE is these PoE hats, I think are like 20 bucks or 25 bucks each. So all the costs add up when you're, when you're building one of these clusters. Uh, so minimizing that cost is nice, uh, making it approachable. And you, you don't even need to have four nodes. You could have two nodes to have a pretty decent little cluster for small applications. Uh, it depends on how much RAM you need, how much CPU your applications use, all those kind of things. Um, somebody asked, uh, what PoE fans do I use? These, these are the official Pi uh, PoE hat. And it, these, these come with, let me move there. Uh, these come with a little fan and you can see it's a small fan. And the rule with fans is typically the smaller the fan, the more noise the thing is going to put out. As a comparison, let me grab... So this is the fan that I use to cool my Compute Module 4 projects. It's a Noctua, what is it, 120 millimeter or something like that. Uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of a size difference here. And uh, using PWM, I can set this Noctua fan down to a slower speed, like you know 500 RPM or something. And it's practically silent, but it moves like 20 times as much air because it's larger surface area. So if you're building a cluster, especially if you're building a custom 3D case, I would recommend ditching these fans. You can just unscrew them and unplug them and putting a fan behind the cluster that just blows a little bit of air across it. Or uh, if you, well, with the PoE board, it's a little harder, but if you don't have the PoE, you can put some big heat sinks on and that should take care of the thermal problem in a Raspberry Pi. Uh, where did I get the lovely case? Uh, this, it's linked on that PyDramble wiki. These are, I think they're called like dog bone boards or something. It's literally just acrylic that's laser cut and you can buy them in kits usually on eBay. I think Amazon might have a couple now too, uh, but there's different styles. There's some with longer little things that stick out, um, but that's, it, it came as a kit with all the, the risers and stuff. Otherwise you can get, I think these are M, M3, M3 uh, little, little screws and risers and, and stuff. You know, just get the right adapters for it. Uh, do I have a, a fan running? Yeah, those little PoE fans. Um, what amount of RAM do I have currently? So I, I've actually changed that up over the years. The first few versions had whatever amount of RAM was available in the Pi, which was a gig for the 2, the 3, and 3 Plus that I was using. This is the Pi 4. The first time I did the Pi 4, I bought 4 with 1 gig of RAM just because they were the cheapest. But now Raspberry Pi has the 2 gig RAM models are 35 bucks. So I upgraded all these nodes to 2 gigs of RAM, which is now the minimum for Kubernetes Master to have 2 gigabytes of RAM. So that's actually a good thing. Um, at some point, I might upgrade to four. Uh, eight gigabytes is a little bit of overkill for Raspberry Pi. I've found that usually applications on the Raspberry Pi, like Drupal, get a little slower because of CPU and not from the RAM limitations. Uh, and so it, it really depends on what you're running on them. 
Uh, if you do need that RAM, the 8 gig option is nice, but it also is a lot more expensive than especially the 2 gig RAM model. Uh, anything else? Is there? <laughs> some people are asking about the the general uh, channel stuff. Is there going to be any more Pico content? I think there will be. Uh, there's there's going to be a few uh, projects that I'm going to work on that that would probably use a Pico and maybe in tandem with a Pi for a couple things I'm doing around the house. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think that that's all the Q and A that we'll do. Um, we're we're getting on 50 minutes or so. <laughs> Where's Red Shirt Jeff? Uh, he doesn't usually make appearances in these live streams. Uh, he sleeps in a lot on Wednesdays, so uh, too bad for him there. It's also probably a good thing because live streams, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and then when you have somebody running around with remote-controlled blowtorches, more things will probably go wrong. Uh, but uh, for next episode, we're going to hear from one of the founders and, and the CTO of the sponsor for this series, which is Amazie.io. I've talked about them a lot before. They offer uh, management for your Kubernetes hosting and have a great product called Lagoon that can help with your application deployments in Kubernetes. He's going to talk about Kubernetes, Lagoon, Drupal, open source, a lot of different topics with me. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of that ecosystem uh, from his perspective as, as a, a guy who is the CTO of a company that does a lot of managed service offerings and uh, has a lot, of, a lot of background in that, in that area. Um, and so please make sure you subscribe, turn on your notifications, uh, smash that like button and all that, all that jazz, uh, because we'll have, um, a couple more episodes of Kubernetes 101 coming out in the next couple weeks, uh, every Wednesday, see you next Wednesday. And until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.